Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? How's the transmission? Loud and clear? Excellent. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, today, we're going to talk about audio basics, the part you were never told. And I'm honored to have fellow Meyer Sound colleague uh, Juan Sierra on today's session that will talk about audio basics, the part that you were never told. But before we do that, as you've grown accustomed, um, I will briefly explain you about the Zoom platform that we're using to conduct these webinars. So please allow me to share my screen and uh, go over the uh, explanation. So we're using Zoom, and um, that means that you are expected to have a window in front of you, not unlike the window that you see over here. Um, we encourage you to ask questions, and in order to do so, we prefer you to use the chat feature. The chat feature uh, can be activated by clicking on the chat balloon in the bottom of this window, and that opens a dialogue on the right-hand side of the screen, which is pretty much self-explanatory. In the bottom, there is a box where you can address the nation and enter a text message, but should you happen to see a fellow colleague, a family member, a friend in the list of participants, then you can also address messages to those individuals. Um, if you would like to ask a question, please make use of the raise hand feature. This way, you can make us aware that you want to ask a question, and I will try to find a white space in um, Juan's narrative interrupt him very politely and inform you, uh, inform Juan <laughs> of, of the question that you're about to ask. Um, that pretty much uh, concludes the um, Zoom introduction. And as I mentioned before, today we will be joined by Juan Sierra, um, acoustic test engineer, and he will um, talk about audio basics, the part you were never told. And with that, we're going to change to um, to Juan. Juan, by all means, uh, take it away. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can. I can hear you. All right. Let's do this. All right, everything okay? Can you see that? Yes, I can see you share your screen. All right. So... I think everything's okay over here. All right. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Juan Sierra. I'm originally from Colombia. Um, I've been, uh, I work for Meyer Sound as acoustic test engineer, and I, I was honored to, I'm, I feel very honored to be asked to, to talk to you guys about this. Um, just a few clarifications. I'm native speaking, I'm a na native speaker uh, Spanish. So if there's something that Maybe I didn't explain myself correctly, or there's something that I'm, I'm not explaining fully. Please let me know. Uh, I, I completely enjoy sharing knowledge and ideas, so let me know if there's anything that needs to be to uh, needs a little bit of clarification. All right. So digital audio basics, the part that you were never told. Wow, it's a huge topic. <laughs> All right, let's try to dig in. So. Um, the first thing that I want to share is like the difference between knowing something and like having a true understanding about how that actually works. Um, for that, I want to uh, get started with a little example, something that I, I, I think is an, a, a nice example of how certain things work, uh, just in general in knowledge. So let's check this. So sum of contiguous odd numbers. and. There's a, uh, there's a sentence that reads, the square root of the sum of contiguous odd numbers is an integer. And the equation that uh, reflects that information is written down below. Um, so to prove that, we just go here, we apply some summation properties, take out the n, uh, take out the two, then we um, apply a property on summation of contiguous integers which is n times n plus 1 divided by 2, we cancel the 2's. Um, we get this expression, which can be factored out as n plus 1 squared and the square root of that. And that indeed shows that n plus 1 uh, belongs to z or z positive, which is the group of, of positive integers. And we tend to say at that moment qed, which is quad erat demonstratum, 
which uh, is just Latin for what we meant to demonstrate. And I think that is super clear, but is that really clear? I mean, we did follow the proof and we did understand that there's just some mathematical jargon to actually explain this situation, but that's not truly understanding. Truly understanding comes from, from visualizing that information and being able to, to, to really integrate that into our knowledge and to be able to use that information in our daily lives. So what about this demonstration? It's completely different. So we start with uh, the square root of the sum of contiguous odd numbers is an integer. All right, so that means 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 plus 9 and so on, so on, so all of those summations will be um, um, square numbers, meaning that they have a square root that is an integer. So let's check this 1 plus 2, uh, sorry, plus 3, 1, 1, 2, 3, plus 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, plus 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and plus 9. And I think that gives like a very interesting insight on what understanding something really is. Because if you try to follow the equations, you would sort of get there. But it's not the same thing as really understanding what things really, what they're trying to tell us. Like this is just some organization of numbers that when you displace contiguous in, uh, odd integer numbers, uh, you get actually a square. So <laughs> the square root of a square is just the side and then that is what we actually meant to demonstrate. Uh, I think this is much a is much is, is much better explanation of what we're trying to to comprehend. And in the same fashion, I think that's what really happens with um, sample rate and bit depth and like all of these basic topics that are meant to be like the fundamentals of audio, but we sort of go through them in a fast fashion that doesn't really explain in detail what they actually mean. So let's take these not as, not as uh, digital audio basics as the simplistic explanation of sample rate and bit depth, but as a, as a true, true, true understanding of the, of the basics of why digital audio actually works. So sample rate and bit depth. So the traditional explanation, and we, what I hope most of you guys actually know at this point is the, number of, the sample rate is the number of samples per unit of time that we select from a, a continuous signal to produce a discrete one. So we just have a continuous stream of information. We, we're going to select certain uh, samples, uh, certain samples per unit of time to produce our digital signal. OK, that's pretty cool. The condition is to sample a signal correctly, it must uh, have a spectrum, a spectrum with a bandwidth smaller than half the sample rate. And that is what we know as the Nyquist and Shannon theorem. And uh, this is. Uh, frequently quoted on ton of discussions online about whether I should use this sample rate or that sample rate, and there's like a ton of implications of what this try, tries to to explain. However, it, it doesn't seem to me that we're that used to really, really understanding why this is the case and why this theorem actually works. So let's try to dig a little bit more into that. All right, uh, in bit depth we tend to say bit depth is the number of bits of information in each sample and because it corresponds to to this number of bits then it corresponds to its resolution all right pretty cool additionally the bit depth determines the level of the quantization error and accordingly the signal to noise ratio and then people often know that 90, 16 bits have a uh, um, dynamic range or a signal to noise ratio of 96 dBs and 24 bits have uh, a signal to noise a maximum signal to noise ratio of 144 dBs. So, okay, that looks pretty interesting. I think these are, are the typical things that every every person in the audio world needs to know. But is this really understanding what these concepts are? Or like do we really 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 visualize that information and can understand what that really means? So, uh, it seems like quad era demonstratum, that was what we intended to show, the bit depth concept and sample rate concepts have been explained, but is that really understanding? All right, let's jump into it. Sample rate, the part that you were never told. So, first of all, a little bit of patience. Um, we're going to dig a little bit more into the details of all of this. Um, I hope you guys can like get something useful out of this. 
but also be sure that there's a ton of other uh, deeper and, and more obscure material to, to research into. So let's just take this as, a, as an initial step. So sampling. Sampling in the most basic form is to select a representative but limited amount of examples from a signal and discard the rest. And there we start our problem, discarding the rest. How can we recover the signal if we are discarding information? So let's check it. To analyze how this actually works, we're going to use three basic things or three basic theorems uh, related to Fourier theory. theory. So um, just don't get afraid of the equations. Uh, we're not actually going to use the full power of the mathematics in this. I just want you to, to check specifically what I'm going to point out. So the Fourier transform is just a, a method to go from the time domain to the frequency domain goes from the spectrum to the waveform or from the waveform to the spectrum. So here I have, this is a, a Fourier uh, pair. This is the spectrum that corresponds to the waveform. And when we apply the direct transform to the waveform, check that this is x of t, x of t. When we apply that direct transform, we go to the, to the spectrum. And when we apply the, the inverse Fourier transform to the spectrum, we go to the waveform. And what I really, really want you guys to, to check is only this little detail. I really, really don't need to, to focus on anything else. The direct transform and the inverse transform are a dual pair, which means that they, they are almost identical. And because, because that happens, the, the only difference between them is just that minus sign on the exponent. That implies that it's almost like they're doing the same thing to go to the other domain. To go from the spectrum to the waveform, we apply a process that is almost equivalent to go that the one that we use to go from the waveform to the to the spectrum, and because of that, um, there's an implication where anything that happens on the time domain that has an effect on the frequency domain is gonna have a dual pair where if we apply the same process in the frequency domain, we're gonna get the same effect on the time domain. So we're gonna check this a little bit more in detail, but I want you guys to have this. Um, notion that if we multiply by two in the time domain and we get a, a, a spectrum that is twice as big in terms of amplitude, then if we do that in the time in the frequency domain, we're going to get the same effect in, effect in the waveform. So let's let's see how we can apply this to understand the sampling theorem. All right, the second thing that we're going to use is the convolution theorem. It seems very complicated, but let's not rush, let, let's, let's take this calmly, and the way we're going to understand the convolution is just by taking our digital signal, which is just this set of points, and by separating that into individual points. So as you can see, this is the amplitude of the, of the sample in time zero, the amplitude of the sample in time one, the amplitude of the sample in time minus one, the amplitude of the sample of the signal on the sample at time minus two. And to do a convolution, we're going to take this amplitude and multiply that by our convolution uh, signal. It's often called a H of N, or a convolution kernel, or, a, or, a, or the signal that we're trying to convolve with. So we're going to replace this in this location, and we're going to get the, the, the convolution kernel or the convolution signal in that location as it's shown here. Then we're going to do the same thing on the time 1, on the time minus 1, and the time 2, as it is shown here. And finally, we just add up vertically all of these values. So a convolution is just a mathematical operation. It just is described as I'm trying to show it, follow certain rules and everything. But the important thing is that the convolution theorem says that if, the, if there's a convolution in the time domain, that is equivalent to a product in the frequency domain. And if you have a convolution in the frequency domain, because of this duality that I was uh, sharing with you before, if there's a convolution on the frequency domain, there's a product on the time domain. So we're going to try to use those two properties and the following one to better understand the sampling theorem. Hmm, I hope you guys are a little bit like this, but we'll just take it slowly and we're going to figure this one out. All right. So the, f the final one is the stretching theorem, which is actually a little bit more intuitive. Uh, stretching theorem says that the stretching in the time domain implies a contraction of the frequency domain. That means if the, if the time domain is, is expanded or is stretched, then the, the spectrum gets contracted. So 
uh, I have a small video over here to show a waveform and in the right side there's a spectrum so as you can see when the signal is contracting in the time its spectrum is expanding and I'm saying that this is actually pretty intuitive because uh, when you have this signal and you stretch it out it's sort of like having um, a tape a magnetic tape and you stretch it out the waveform gets elongated and because it gets elongated then um, the, the spectrum gets contracted the frequencies go to lower lower frequencies take into account that this frequency plot goes from minus frequency to plus frequency so it is accounting for both positive and negative frequencies uh, once again this is a waveform and when you contract the waveform the spectrum expands when you contract the and when you expand the waveform where you make it the waveform longer the spectrum contracts so again a com combination of the stretching theorem and the duality theorem where anything that happens in the waveform the, the, the time domain that has an effect on the frequency domain can be inverted and seen the other way around all right wow now this becomes interesting so sampling which was our selection of examples of the waveform in different times at regular intervals it's equivalent to multiplying uh, the signal by a pulse strain a pulse strain is just uh, one zero 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 one zero 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 and that impulse strain has this um, this time domain representation interestingly it has a, a spectrum that is also similar to a pulse strain so when you have this waveform and you multiply this signal by this signal you obtain sampled intervals or sample values and because you have this it's a product in the time domain then you have a convolution in the frequency domain what you get is this spectrum which was the original spectrum of the signal at this location because it was convolved and as I explained before convolution we're going to understand it here in a very simplistic way is just to use this convolution kernel or, or this convolution signal and set it up in each of these pulses and as you can see, the resulting spectrum is actually a repetition of this spectrum in each of these individual uh, frequencies. So the interesting part is to see, well, it's not really that we're discarding that much information in, in the sense that the complexity of the signal is lower in the time domain after the multiplication, but the complexity of the spectrum is higher after the multiplication. So we're sort of pushing the complexity of the information into the frequency domain to be able to to digitize this information and get a hold of smaller chunks of information without losing uh, actually any data so let's see if this actually uh, works this is a uh, an interactive plot for that uh, example and as you can see this is the sampling period these are this is the impulse strain or this is the the, the it has a periodicity and if we sample every six time units then the Nyquist limits get smaller because we're sampling uh, less often and the images get closer to each other if we go to a higher sampling rate then the uh, spectral images separate and just as well after the convolution the, uh, the repeated spectru spectra gets uh, separated a little bit all right, this works very nicely. Let's go back to our presentation. Now, if you're gonna do the reconstruction of this information, then that is equivalent to multiplying the spectrum of our digital signal by a low pass filter uh, spectrum. So this is the spectrum that we just had before. This is the digitized spectrum. And when you multiply this information or this signal with this low pass filter, again because of the convolution theorem it's just a convolution between each of these samples and these which is actually the impulse response of this spectrum of this low pass filter so what we're going to do is in each of these uh, positions in time we're going to replace this um, convolution kernel in this case it would be inverted so it would go a little bit more like this and uh, then we're going to add all of these uh, data points together in, at all times. And we're, when we do that, we actually get a reconstruction of our signal in, the perfect, in a perfect manner. Um, if you can see that over here, it's very obvious that we're, what we're doing as a product of these two spectrums is actually going to get this. Uh, 
because the spectrum at these uh, other frequencies is zero everywhere, then the product between these zeros and all of these guys is just going to be zero, and we end up with the original spectrum that we started with. So, again, let's go to uh, the example of this. This is, uh, again, the interactive version of that. And um, let's see. The sampling period is 5 right now. If we go to 6, uh, we should see that the Nyquist frequency got smaller and the spectral images are closer to each other. Huh, interesting. What about if we go to 7? We're right at the edge of, of complying with the Nyquist theorem. So if we go here, 7, you're going to see that the Nyquist, theor Nyquist, um, the Nyquist limit is smaller than our orig original spectrum. And because of that, there's some aliasing going around here. This spectral image started to sum with this spectral image. And because they overlapped, then that's what we called aliasing. So let's check, uh, let's check the time domain representation. If we have a sampling period of 7, you can see some odd behavior in this part of the signal that was not there before. And to show that it was not there before, I'm going to use a, a faster sampling rate or a, a smaller sampling period, and we're going to have our signal. If I go even lower, you're going to see that the reconstruction doesn't change at all. So using a higher sample rate is not, is not changing our analog signal in any way. It is just expanding more and more the limits of the Nyquist theorem, is Nyquist frequency, and it's separating more the, uh, the repeated spectra, and it's increasing the bandwidth of the low-pass filter. But the original signal is completely reconstructed. So I hope that this gives you a little bit of a better understanding of how, how actually the, the sampling theorem actually works and how or, or why it is important to comply with it in the sense of our signal needs, needs to be band limited um, below the Nyquist frequency. Otherwise, we're going to get a replicated spectra that is going to overlap with our original spectra, and then we're going to get aliasing. All right. Um, so, it is interesting that most people think that aliasing is a byproduct of digitization, but it, it is not really a byproduct of digitization itself. It's a property of digital systems. And we're going to see why. So, here, uh, you have uh, Fs over 2, which is our Nyquist frequency, and at Nyquist frequency you see that there's uh, two samples per period of this waveform. In that sense, we have one sample over here, one sample over here, and then we get another um, crest on our, our waveform, and that is uh, exactly how the reconstructed waveform would look exactly at Fs over 2. If we go a little bit to a lower frequency as this one is, you're going to see that the digitized samples or, or the this, this sampling um, technique will return us specific samples. These three samples are equivalent to these other three samples. And they're equivalent because these two frequencies are uh, have the same distance to Fs over 2. So the, this one is one frequency up, this one was one frequency down. So for the digital system, there's no difference between them because when you try to, to digitize them, it actually got exactly the same samples. As you can see, this guy has, uh, I don't know, minus 0 0.75, 0, 0 0.75, minus 1, etc., etc., etc. And just as well with even lower frequencies and even higher frequencies. The interesting side is, let's analyze this one on Fs over 2, and let's think about what would be the case if we square that signal. If we square this signal in the digital domain, we're going to get minus 1 times minus 1 is going to be 1, minus 1 times minus 1 is going to be 1, minus 1 times minus 1 is going to be 1, and we're going to get a flat signal. Why is that? Well, because squaring a, a sinusoid actually uh, doubles its frequency. And because it doubles its frequency, um, it will end up at Fs exactly. Think about it, if you square the analog waveform, you're going to get 1 over here, but the square of 0 is 0, and the square of 1, of minus 1 is 1, so you would get more of a, a, a sinusoid that has twice as much frequency. But our digital signal, when it got squared, is actually just once. And that happens exactly because DC, or zero frequency, is an alias for Fs, because they are exactly the same distance from Fs over 2.
So you can see that alias aliasing is not a property, is not a characteristic of, of the process of digitization. It's a characteristic of digital systems in general. And any post any processing that you, you do, if it in, includes uh, some non-linearity, might produce aliasing. So we're going to check that a little bit more in detail. Hope you guys are thinking about uh, all of these uh, things in detail. All right. So what the sampling theorem does not warranty. And this is an interesting aspect because a lot of discussions about sampling frequency uh, cite Nyquist frequency and Nyquist and Shannon theorem without actually uh, like overlooking these two essential uh, characteristics. So obtaining analog samples that are uh, Oh, oh, okay, okay. So obtaining analog samples that are a good representation of the analog wa waveform is not guaranteed. And why is that the case? Mm, well, because the sampling theorem tells you that you can, with these digital samples, you can recreate the analog waveform. But it doesn't mean that the digital samples are going to look exactly or are going to be a good representation of the analog waveform. So let's check a quick example for that. Here I have a non-intuitive reconstruction example. All right. So this is our digital signal, 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5, 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5, and there's a repeated value over here. So if you go into an analyzer and check the peak value of that, you're going to see that it's actually 0 0.5, which is minus 6 dB FS. After you do the sync interpolation, which is the product between the, the signal and the low-pass um, low pass filter frequency response, or the convolution with its kernel, you're going to get a bunch of combination of sinusoids that are going to add up, up, up above and below. So at each of these samples, there's that uh, wiggly waveform that we saw that is just a, a sync function, actually. However, notice that in every point you have, you have some values above, some values below. But over here, there's only information above. And because you have that, then the analog signal that it gets reconstructed, it looks actually like this. So <laughs> that's actually pretty scary because Obviously, this, this digital signal was designed to produce this effect. But what's interesting is that the peak value measured at, uh, at this sample rate, just taking into account the digital samples, would give us minus 6 dBFS. But when you reconstruct the full signal, it is actually overshooting by something around 3 dBs. So the peak value of the analog signal is actually 9 dBs above the uh, peak value of the digital signal. So. Uh, is this relevant or what's the, the, the point of all of this? Let's check that a little bit more with a quick example. So here we have a shape demo, that's what I've labeled this. And shape demo, uh, it just has this guy. Let me turn down, down this thing. And let's open this mute. All right, so I, hope I, I think you guys should be hearing small amount of noise. I don't want you guys to hear that too much, but just to, so that you know that what is happening. I can so this is white noise. Can hear the noise, uh, Juan? Is that too loud? No, that's fine. All right. So um, just know that that is actually happening in real time. Uh, all right. So this is a limiter that is uh, in, like set up to engage whenever the signal surpasses some peak value. As you can see, the value of the white noise is 0 dBFS, so it is actually hitting every time uh, like that limit, but it's not actually overshooting, so it shouldn't be activated by the, the limiter shouldn't be activated by this signal. But when we reconstruct the signal or apply oversampling of 2x, then you're going to see a huge difference on the result because there is a 5.8 overshoot on the analog reconstruction of that signal. So going back to um, this representation, it is actually, this is exactly what is happening. The digital signal has a peak value of some value, and the analog reconstructed signal, which is simulated when do, we do some oversampling by re recreating this actual value, it's actually overshooting by a lot. So it's interesting to see that act that act can actually happen, and that is a, very often happening, just that sometimes we're not seeing that those effects, or maybe we're not even aware that they are happening. All right. So going back to this and going back to this, all right. The other thing is that processing digital samples and obtaining an analog waveform with an equivalent processing scheme is not guaranteed. That means that if, if you process a digital signal, it is not exactly the same as processing an analog signal. And uh, like if you, if you were to uh, 
to do a parallel processing between those, the analog and the digital one, and expect the same thing at the end, that might not be warranted. And why is that not guaranteed? If the processing is actually a uh, linear and time invariant behavior, like a filter or an equalizer, the, the processing could be very, very, very equivalent. But when there's uh, non-linearities involved, there's a huge, huge impact. So let's check that. Here I have another demo, aliasing demo. And I have, this is just a sine sweep that is uh, going from, from 20 to 20 kilohertz. Oh, let's remove this guy. So you can see that that is actually happening. And um, I wrote a small plugin that uh, squares the signal. So if I square the signal, as I said before, it should introduce the second harmonic. And when you do that, you got your distortion going on. But when that distortion surpasses the, uh, the Nyquist frequency, you get a ton of aliasing. So when you do that, uh, the digital signal didn't change exactly, exactly as you intended it to change because the, the aliasing just introduced some abnormal frequencies that were not the, the ones that you, we were expecting. So, okay, that's, uh, I think that's a pretty interesting demonstration of that. Let's go back to our presentation. All right. I hope you guys are like, what? Maybe I was never told about this, but it's like an interesting thing that we should be aware of. All right. Uh, digital perspective. Finally, all of this is on the framework of, well, we're going to digitize the signal, and we're going to do blah, 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 and then we're going to reconstruct our analog signal. But I want also to provide like a little bit of a digital perspective on what's going on with, with the sampling rate specifically. So what is time for, for a digital processor? Digital systems process samples that are being read at a certain speed and are converted into frequencies because of that read speed. That read speed is defined by the sampling frequency. However, they don't really care that much about time. I and mean, actually, in most programming languages, there's no, there's no concept of time. You just have some information related to the sampling frequency, and you have some vector that is read at certain speed. When you have a sinusoid, for example, at 441 uh, hertz, at a sample rate of 44.1 kilohertz, this um, uh, waveform, and you compare that to the sinusoid at 480 hertz at a si uh, sample rate of, oops, sorry, this is 48 kilohertz, so 480 to 48 kilohertz and 441 to 44.1 kilohertz, you actually see that those waveforms are actually pretty similar. No, 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 they're not similar. They're exactly the same. Because for the digital system, the only thing that matters is the ratio between the frequency and the sampling rate. And because of that, you might start thinking, all right, if I implement a notch filter at 441 hertz at a sample rate of 44.1 kilohertz, that process needs to be exactly the same as 480 hertz at 48 kilohertz, meaning that the processing scheme needs to change when using a sampling rate and change into a different one. And because of that, well, it's pretty interesting to see that every single algorithm needs to adapt to the sample rate in some way. The sampling, the sam sampling frequency, sorry for this small typo, connects the continuous time with discrete samples. In that sense, hmm, let's think about this. So, what is affected by, oof, affected by sample rate? So, actually, what is not affected by sample rate? Because when you think about it, every process that we, need, we tend to use starts to use, whoops, starts to use uh, in some way uh, the sample rate or needs a definition of time. So when we talk about filters, we use frequency and that needs some definition of time. When we use compressors that uses time, the attack and release time and that uses some definition of time. When we use gates, expanders, uh, dynamic processing, multiband compressors, uh, dynamic equalizers, everything. Even if you're doing some editing and you're just doing a fade in and a fade out, that involves some definition of time because you're asking for a fade that happens on certain amount of time. So everything is affected by sample rate. Every single process, even distortion, even if it's a, a non-time dependent distortion, needs some definition of time to avoid these aliasing frequencies that I was talking about. <laughs> Sorry, my cat is on that side. All right. Uh, so I hope this opens the discussion to a little bit more than just that. A uh, quick example to show that is high-frequency warping. 
High frequency warping is a phenomenon that happens on uh, filters uh, digitized with a method called the bilinear transform. Uh, the bilinear transform is a, is a method that uses the transfer function to in the analog domain and digitizes it to convert into a digital domain. And because of that, it uses, uh, oops, you guys are not seeing my camera at this moment. All right. Because of that, they actually, it's like the frequency domain goes all the way up to, to infinity in the analog uh, domain. And when you go to a digital domain, you compress that to match uh, the Nyquist frequency. Because of that, there's a lot of uh, like warping on the high frequencies uh, on digital filters, specifically, the, specifically those designed with this method, the bilinear transfer. So let's see how that actually behaves or how that actually works. Let's check this filter C warping and let's check a parametric filter at gain 9 dBs. Come on, is this, let's update it. All right. So the gain goes up to nine. All right, that works fine. We go, when we're using low frequencies, that works fine. But when we go up to very high frequencies, there's a mismatch between the analog intended transfer function and the digital obtained uh, transfer function, the, the orange one being the digital one. As you can see, because of this accumulation of frequencies in the high part of the spectrum, you obtain uh, some warped uh, definition of the filter. Or you can check the low pass filter definition, and it also has some odd warping, and you can check a high shelf definition, and it also has some odd warping. A good method to, to solve this, there, and there are several methods to, to work around this, but if you increase the sample rate, you're going to see that the warping goes uh, to very high frequencies that are beyond what we can hear. And because of that, you get a much better frequency response on your digital filter. So that's a, actually an interesting uh, way of handling this. All right. Uh, we're here, I can go back here, and I'm going to put this guy over here. So, ah, here comes the trick. Myers Sound Digital Processors actually run um, 96 kilohertz, and as you can see, the digital filters shown in, in this is our graphical interface for uh, processors like uh, Galaxy. Um, this is the Compass uh, user interface. They actually, this is a parametric 120 hertz, 100, 125 hertz, and this is the same parametric near 20 kilohertz. Because there's, uh, the, sound, the processor is running at 96 kilohertz, then there's not such a thing as the, this nasty uh, effect on the warping of digital frequencies. Um, Juan, Berlin, right. you've, yes? you've checked your camera. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Uh, so much technology these days. <laughs> All right, how are we doing? Is that somehow clear if, if there's any specific questions about this part? No, should I keep going? Yes, please. All right, so uh, I hope that give a different perspective about frequency, uh, uh, about sampling frequency, and, and let's, let's dig into the other side of this, into bit depth, the part that you were never told. So, uh, again, bit depth is one of those concepts that is explained as the number of bits on our world length or on our digital world, and that corresponds to our resolution or our, our dynamic range available. However, I want to like sort of share a different perspective about how this actually works. So the quantization is in essence uh, quantization. The process itself is is in essence to measure the amplitude of a signal in an instant with a limited amount of precision. So when you have like a ruler, you say, okay, this, is, this measures 25 centimeters and three millimeters, and you have a limited amount of resolution in that, and you have some uncertainty in that measurement. That uncertainty is just, okay, I cannot measure any more precise than one millimeter. So we have an uncertainty of plus or, plus or, plus or minus half a millimeter if you're like good enough on, on the rounding and everything. Um, and that is exactly what is happening sort of on, on, on our, our digital signal. Every measuring, measuring system has some uncertainty. And this uncertainty is related exactly to our quantization error. Uh, it, it actually bounds it. So we're going to check how that actually happens. <laughs> 
So, uh, interesting to see that when we talk about 16 bits on a CD, in a, on an audio CD, or 24 bits on a uh, WAV file, we have a uniform quantization scheme. Uh, in a uniform quantization scheme, the the uncertainty, which is this range, like what the space that we're not sure, the these are the continuous amplitude signal uh, values and get quantized to these the uh, quantized amplitude. When you analyze this spacing around that, that is our uncertainty. That's everything around there could have been the value of this amplitude, but it was quantized to that specific amplitude. So it's interesting to see that the range that we're trying to quantize is not the the last quantization step is not exactly at the edge of the of the range. The quantization error is distributed uniformly across the quantizer so that each uh, quantization step has exactly the same quantization error. So um, we then define some bit words to define to to represent this amplitude. So in a four bit in a two bit scheme, for example, this could be zero 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 one and one zero. Why we don't have four amplitudes? Well, there's a difference between mid step and mid thread uh, mid thread quantizers. Uh, mid thread quantizers. value at zero and if you have a, a not number an even number of samples then you don't have anything in between like if you have only four fingers there's there's no finger in between but if you have five fingers then there's one uh, one of them is in the middle so we prefer schemes where you can obtain a value at zero just because it's such a common value on, on digital signals that we just need something over there um, there's other uh, solutions to this situation, like assigning one extra um, uh, quantization step to the negative side of the waveform, as it happens actually on the red book on PCM encoding for uh, audio CDs. Um, but that's just a min minor detail when you go to higher bit depths. Um, in essence, with each bit that you gain, you have six dBs more of dynamic range. Why is that happening? Well, because if you multiply by 10, let's say a, num a number in decimal representation like 70, you obtain 700. That is just shifting the numbers one side to one, one position to the left. Uh, that happens because the base is actually 10. In binary notation, because the base is actually two, when you shift the numbers by one, uh, decim one, by one binary position actually, um, you are actually multiplying by two. And because multiplying by two or a factor of two is actually the same as six dBs, it makes sense that each bit gives us six dBs of dynamic range. All right. So, uh, uniform quantization has constant uncertainty. And what that actually means is that if you check this is the quantized value, the analog value gets quantized to the, to the light blue dot, and this is the uncertainty. That is the uncertainty because if you actually go higher and you have an analog value that is closer to the limit of the uncertainty, you surpass it, then it would have been quantized to the other step. So the uh, uncertainty is bounded by this uh, number of bits, which define the number of quantization steps on our quantization scheme. Because the quantization noise is constant, then the only thing that defines the signal to noise ratio is the value of the signal. That means well, if the signal is high, the signal-to-noise ratio is high. If the signal is low, the signal-to-noise ratio is low. So the signal is the defining factor on uh, uniform quantization. Um, all right. Let's jump into this other complex topic of floating-point quantization. So the interesting thing about floating-point quantization is that it's a non-uniform distribution of quantization steps. That means that... Um, bigger values actually have more uncertainty than smaller values. If you think about uh, scientific notation, you have the, the mantisa, which is the, 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 the significant part of the representation, a base that we're going to use as a scaling factor and an exponent. And the exponent is just going to scale the mantisa. So um, when you go through this process, you see that 4.2 times 10 to the 5, well, it has one uh, significant position on the de after the decimal point, but the next value cannot be represented. However, that, that uncertainty produced by the inability to represent that number is very, very big in comparison to 4.2 times 10 to the minus 5. 
If that was the case, the number would be very, very small, and the inability to represent uh, the second decimal position would represent a very, very small um, quantization error. So, as we know, a part of the digital world represents the mantissa and the other the exponent. In a 24-bit, in a 32-bit floating-point scheme, if it follows uh, the, the standard for floating-point representation stated on IEEE 754, if I recall correctly, then the fraction has, or the mantise has, 24 bits, and often the sign is attached to that, so we say that the mantise has 24 bits of precision, and the exponent has 8 bits. Uh, an interesting thing as well is to see that some values have multiple representations. For example, you can represent either positive zero or negative zero, and as a, that's actually considered into the standard, and it's, it's okay. So, it's also a misrepresentation of 32-bit floating point to say that it actually has 2 to the 32 different combinations because some of them are actually repeated and some of them are actually even invalid. So they are not valid representation according to the standard. Um, so in floating point quantization, you get uh, an uncertainty that is proportional to the level of the signal. That means if the signal is bigger, as this sample is, the, the amplitude is on the y-axis, then the separation between the steps is bigger and the quantization error, or this area that we don't really know whether the signal was over here or over here, but it was quantized to this value, that range is bigger on, on bigger amplitudes and smaller on smaller amplitudes. That means that the signal-to-noise ratio is actually constant. And, wow, whoa, let's let that sink in a little bit. If you have a big signal, you have a signal-to-noise ratio of x dBs. And if you have a smaller signal, you have a signal-to-noise ratio of x dBs. Okay, okay. So if the signal is big, there's more noise or more quantization error. And if the signal is small, there's less quantization error. Ah, that seems a little bit sneaky. Let's, let's see if that actually holds. So I have another example over here. It's a, a, a sign sweep. That's just running over there. I'm gonna check that with inside. It's just a um, spectrum analyzer. Uh, drop the level a little bit. And uh, I'm gonna use this, um, this plugin to, to reduce the resolution to 7 bits. As you can see, there's a lot of quantization error going on right now. And if I move the level of the signal, it changes slightly because the quantization error has a high dependent on the, is highly dependent on the signal in its shape or its spectral content, but it is not really uh, changing overall in the amount of energy that it holds. However, if I remove this guy and insert a floating point quantizer, this is also a plugin that I wrote just a couple of days ago to show this. If I drop the level, our signal to uh, noise ratio is constant and it increases and if I go up on level the signal to noise ratio because it's constant the noise level actually increases so I think that's a pretty interesting insight about how floating point actually works and and how fixed point or uniform quantization schemes behave all right hope that was sort of a good representation of, of what actually happens Let's go back here and let's bring the camera over here. All right. So when do we find this? 16-bit uh, fixed point happens in our audio CDs. 24-bit C uh, fixed point happens on professional audio files. 32-bit uh, floating point uh, has 24-bit mantis and 8 of exponent. And 64-bit floating point has uh, 53 of mantis and 11 of exponent. So let's run a few, a few ideas here. 64-bit uh, floating point is so, so precise that just the mantisa, the 53-bit uh, fixed point representation of the part of the, of the world, of the digital world, um, has a precision that reaches a part in one, in something like 1 to the 10 to, 1 times 10 to the 16. So that is 16 zeros, 1, uh, one, one and 16 zeros. And if you think about it, that number is so, so, so big that you could try to measure like the, 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 in, a, in a helium atom, the uh, atomic radii is, is uh, close to 0 0.25 angstroms. One angstrom is 1 times 10 to the minus 10. So 
okay, we used 10 of our zeros, and then we still have six more because it's 10 to the 16. And the distance between Colombia and uh, San Francisco is something like 6,000 kilometers, so six, 6 million meters. And if you check that, that really means that if you had a ruler that extends from Bogota, where I am right now, to San Francisco, you would still have the precision to measure one atomic radii, or, or the uncertainty would be around that value. So it's pretty interesting to see the, the, the possibilities that we achieve with, with this uh, re number representation. Uh, all right, so, true story. <laughs> so um, what, all of, the, what, the, what, what all, of, all of this means is, okay, let's take, um, let's say, this graph shows um, the input level in comparison to the signal to noise ratio. That means if you have an input level of minus 25 dBs in a representation of 8 bits, your signal to noise ratio would be 25 dBs. And as you can see, the expected common values would, would hold under that. So uh, 8 bits, 8 times uh, 6, would give us something roughly like 48 dBs of dynamic range when the signal is at, at, at its maximum. And it's lower, uh, smaller signal to noise ratios when the signal is lower than that. Uh, obviously, that shows that this is a fixed point re representation. So these guys are fixed point representations, and these are floating point representations with scale factor and mantissa number of bits. If we go up uh, into this is, uh, for example, 412, so 12 bits of mantissa and 4 of exponent, we get a constant signal to noise ratio at all of these input values that is roughly around uh, 70 something dBs. So let's, let's check that a little bit more in detail over here. So the, 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 um, we're saying 12, 12 bits, so 12 times 6 is actually 72. So why are we getting uh, a little bit of a higher value? The value that we're getting here is uh, 76 dBs roughly, 78 dBs. Um, the, Floating point representation standard allows for an implicit bit that gives us one extra bit of resolution in comparison to the fixed point representation on the Mantissa side. So actually a 12-bit um, digital representation, it gives actually 13 bits of precision on uh, the floating point representation. And that is where that uh, excess of 6 dBs more come from. 32 bits has, uh, this is, Oh, 32 bits is the, is the gray one. So 24, time, uh, 24 bits of precision on the mantissa and 8 bits for the exponent would give us, in contrast to the, to the usual 24 bit on, on wave files, we get 6 dBs more, which is, uh, again, explained by this implicit bit on the representation. All right, I hope that sort of clarifies a little bit better how, how this bit depth deal actually works. All right. Juan, so, um, Juan, please check your camera once more. Oh, sorry. All right. <clears throat> so, Meyer Sound Digital Processors, and this is like an, in, an interesting uh, side of this, and is, well, when a company is really pursuing like very, very high quality and they're really interested in achieving like what's the best for our signals, you can see that, okay, I mean, 24 bits has a lot of dynamic range. It's, it's, it's plenty. Uh, but even like, um, let's say, the old series of processors on, on Meyer Sound, um, like Galileo, which is some, something around mid-2000s or something, it is a, running a 32-bit floating point uh, scheme. Uh, when we go and advance on time, we go to our newest processor like the Galaxy, and it actually runs on 64-bit uh, fixed-point architecture, thanks to some, like, the, the, the details of the implementation are a little bit tricky, but it, it is sort of based on an FPGA chip that allows a 64-bit pro uh, uh, processing scheme. A 64-bit processing scheme actually goes closer to uh, a precision of one part in 10 to the 19. And 10 to the 19 is, is <laughs> such a crazy thing, like 10 to the 19 allows us to measure from Pluto, the furthest planet from the sun, to the sun uh, is uh, 
wouldn't, wouldn't, if, if we try to measure that, we would still have enough precision to measure something like a thousandth of a, of a human hair. So the precision that we're using in, in all of these products and that we're using to manipulate all of these signals and the, 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 the attention to detail on all of these processors is, is very, very, very high. And when you really understand how BitDepth works and how sampling rate works, you can start seeing all of the, all of the value of all of these things. All right, so this was digital audio basics. As you can see, it was not super basic. It was actually a little bit more in depth of what's going on with all of these uh, fundamentals of digital audio signals. Um, but also, I want to encourage you guys to, to, to search a little bit more about this because there's a lot of things down there. There's a lot of interesting knowledge and there's a lot of interesting topics to still uh, talk about. So, final uh, thoughts about all of this. The attachment to the, to the known. Like, digital audio is so often explained as a simulation of, an analo of, ana of analog audio. But is this correct? Like, we saw that the floating point quantization scheme has a variable signal to noise ratio, uh, per, sorry, sorry, a constant signal to noise ratio that changes with the amplitude of the signal. And that never happens on, on analog systems. On analog systems, we measure signal to noise ratio by using, okay, let's put the sinusoid and let's see where it distorts. Let's see the maximum capabilities of the system. And then let's remove every signal and let's check the noise floor. And then we calculate the signal to noise ratio. Is this processing scheme or this, this measuring technique even, even does, does it even make sense on digital signals? When there's no digital audio, when everything is zero, there's no noise. Like both the quant uniform quantization and floating point quantization, they both have uh, a perfect representation of the value zero. So in the digital domain, when there's no signal, there's nothing. There's not even noise or there's not even error, unless we start talking about things like Dether and so on and so on. So, And of course, all of these signals will become analog signals at some point. But the, the, the analysis of digital signals needs to consider how, uh, how digital signals really work. And they are not exactly as analog signals. So again, another thought for you is, well, <laughs> The power of digital signals, of digital systems is undeniable. Like, when you think about the dynamic range that we can hold, the precision that we can measure, it's so, so astonishing that is, no analog system will ever be remotely close to having that amount of precision. And if you think that, oh, this conversion between 64-bit floating point to 64-bit fixed point is going to make some difference on your representation of digital signals, we'll think about like the precision that we're handling. It, we're, we're literally talking about a difference that is so, so, so small that we're able to measure things of the scale of our whole solar system and still have precision comparable to molecules and like very small um, organic structures. So it's really interesting to to see people questioning the, the possibilities of digital representations in that regard. And finally, there's, again, a lot to discover, a lot to learn. This is just a very, very quick overview that tried to, to give you guys a little bit of a better understanding of the fundamentals and to, as I was saying at the very beginning, to, to understand really how things are working, to have a better understanding of, of each summation, each, sub, each subtraction, if, of how our digital signal is changing through time. But again, there's a ton of things to, to think about. Just think about this. We studied all of this and we went through all of these examples, but there was barely one equation. Think about how would it be to study all of this in depth. So there's a lot of to explore. So again, if there's any questions, and even at this moment or in a further time, Contact me, I'm fully, uh, I'm entirely happy to share all of this information. All right, so I think that was pretty much it. Thank you so much to all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Juan. Um, much appreciated. So, no problem. Um, we have a couple of more minutes. Does anyone uh, want to ask Juan any questions before we, um, before we uh, finish uh, today's session? Okay.
Well, in that case, I would like to very much express my gratitude to um, fellow Meyerson colleague Juan Sierra, acoustic test engineer, for uh, taking us on a super interesting journey in the um, in the domain of uh, digital audio. And that means that uh, this Friday is a holiday, so there won't be a webinar this Friday. Same goes uh, for next Monday, but as of uh, Tuesday next week, we will start doing webinars uh, once more, which will be announced at the Meyer Sound Facebook page and also in the Meyer Sound user community. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us. It was really cool to share all of this. Please, if you have any questions at any time, just contact me, either uh, my Myersound email, Juan S at Myersound.com, or just find me on Facebook or something, and I love to talk about all of these things. <laughs> so Excellent. Thank you to, uh, to all. Much appreciated. And hope Thank you, Merlin. Hope to see you next time. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.